This is the Brain Chip Podcast. Hear from our thought leaders about neuromorphic computing, beneficial AI, and how Brain Chip's Akita is pushing AI to the edge. This podcast is a place for investors, practitioners, and anyone interested in the future of AI. Hello, and welcome to the June edition of Brain Chips. This is our mission podcast, which is meant for those interested in artificial intelligence and machine learning. I'm Nandan Nayampali, Chief Marketing Officer and Head of Product at Brainship. And while I have been a guest on this podcast, it's my first time hosting it. So that's my early disclaimer. So as you know, Brainship has been consistently associated with advanced research and academia, while at the same time finding a faster path of application of this new research and commercializing it to actual devices today. But let me introduce today's guest who's associated uh, with this field in academia, Dr. Gaurav Sukhatne, Professor of Computer Science and Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Southern California, or USC, in Los Los Angeles. For those who may not have seen this yet, USC just announced their exciting Frontiers of Computing initiative, which is a $1 $1 billion 10-year initiative to fast-track developments in advanced computing. We will hear more about that from Gaurav soon. Gaurav holds a, the Fletcher Jones Foundation Endowed Chair in the Computer Science uh, Faculty and serves as the Executive Vice Dean at USC's Viterbi School of Engineering. He's currently also an active Amazon scholar. He has served as chairman of the computer science department at USC from 2012 to 2017. He is the co-director of USC's Robotics Research Laboratory and the director of the USC Robotic Embedded Systems Laboratory, which he founded in 2000. His research is in networked robots, learning robots, and overall field robots, which are pushing bounds in automation, autonomy, and intelligence. He has been published extensively in these and related areas, and he's a fellow of the AAAI and the IEEE, and a recipient of the NSF Career Award and the Okawa Foundation Research Award. He received his undergraduate education at IIT Bombay and MS and PhD degrees from USC. The rest of his accolades and the list uh, of his memberships is so long that it might take this whole podcast. So we may just redirect you to his intro page at USC. So with all of that said, welcome, Gaurav. Thank you. Well, uh, you know, we go back a long way um, and knowing where you, uh, in fact, we had common alma maters, From there on, you've gone from strength to strength, uh, from the start of your academic career to now, achieving so much in the arena of robotics. So can you give us a little bit of a flavor on what inspired you to follow this path? Yeah, Um, so Nandan, thanks very much for um, having me on this uh, this program. Um, You know, I think my fascination for robotics and artificial intelligence more broadly Uh, goes back to my undergraduate days when uh, I took my first undergraduate class in AI and actually ended up writing my senior thesis on neural networks. And I sort of felt like of all the areas in computer science, uh, it was the most fascinating for me. And so when I applied to graduate school, I was pretty sure that I wanted to do something in AI and robotics. I wasn't entirely sure what that would be. Uh, But fortunately for me, I I arrived at USC as a graduate student in 1991, and uh, there were some uh, formidable forces here in both AI and robotics and also in neural computation, and I took some classes from them, and that really sort of fired up my interest and focused my attention, and I chose to do a PhD in robotics. Uh, now, that was over 30 years ago, and the field has changed considerably, but it's been, it's been quite a journey. So I, I, I sort of credit my mentors, both when I was an undergrad and also when I was a graduate student, um, for sort of kindling an interest 
in in robotics and and AI more broadly. That sounds awesome, and and it's clear you've been there for a very long time, spanning three decades, right? And a lot of experience, not just in the research aspect and, and developing students and coursework, um, but actually driving the research towards industry as well. So, I mean, obviously you have vast experience in this. How far would you say we have come today from when we started? So, uh, you know, when I look back 30 odd years, uh, it's kind of remarkable how much progress we've made in, uh, in robotics and autonomy and artificial intelligence and, you know, many of the allied disciplines. Um, the, there are many sort of dimensions along which you could characterize the change. I mean, the, the big, the big uh, change, of course, is the amount of uh, innovation that has gone into AI and robotics broadly, and just the sheer number of new businesses and new commercial opportunities that have now uh, come up in this space. And, and, and I think we're only just beginning. I mean, I think the space is, is expanding even faster today than it was five years ago or 10 years ago. And certainly 30 years ago, um, there was a lot of promise, but uh, things were just not quite ready. And so we've come a long way. Um, you know, when, when I think back on it, the, one of the interesting things to reflect on is the reason for this. And there are many reasons, but, but I think it's been an interesting confluence of, of sort of, uh, you know, tremendous advances in compute infrastructure that enables many of the modern machine learning and AI techniques to actually run. Um, tremendous advances in building new kinds of sensing systems that robots rely on to do their tasks. Uh, and tremendous, of course, advances in fundamental computer science and algorithmic techniques to tie all of these things together. And so in some sense, robotics uh, is such an integrative discipline that when you look back, you realize that there is a series of these interlocking things that come together and, and you know, you sort of feel like a new technology is born, but really it's the accretion of a lot of these pieces coming together over time. Um, and so, you know, when, when I began 30 years ago, the challenge was you had to build all the components for yourself, right? A typical graduate student would end up building their own robot, would end up programming their own robot. Very often, the earliest robots I built as a graduate student, I actually wired up the hardware for them even though my PhD was largely on, uh, on the computer science side of things. And that, those sorts of challenges um, are, are sort of not what we work on today. There's been such progress that, a, that, that you know, many of those things can be compartmentalized and you can rely on modules that work well that you can build on. And that's the sign of maturity of a discipline where, where things start to become uh, modularized to the point where others who come after you can build on them. So that's one main difference. Um, the, the nice thing about a discipline like robotics and more broadly about autonomy and, and artificial intelligence is the frontier is so big that even though we've made tremendous progress over the last uh, three, four decades and startling progress over the last decade, there are so many open challenges, right? We still don't fully understand how to build out fully autonomous systems. We're just beginning to understand how to build systems that exhibit some degree of autonomy in typically in structured environments, though to some extent, we're now able to deal with more unstructured environments. Um, and so there are tremendous challenges in getting robots to function in environments that are that have not been designed specifically for the robot. Um, you know, difficult environments um, like, the, like the natural environment, outdoors, or people's homes, all of which are different from each other. So these challenges are really, really still drive tremendous technological innovations in robotics. Um, so in a, in a way, you know, when I look back on it, I feel like we've come very far as a field, but at the same time, there's this sense that there is an enormous frontier still ahead of us. No, that sounds great. I mean, I guess the, the very telling uh, contrast is comparing Sony's Ibo robotic dog from a couple of decades back with the Boston Dynamics version, which is literally uh, as close to what you could consider something that could 
autonomously operate, at least in a slightly more structured environment. Absolutely. I mean, when you look at an example like that, you see, you know, how much, how far we've come. Um, you know, agile locomotion control, um, in the example you gave, is a wonderful example of that. And autonomy built on top of platforms that can execute that kind of agile autonomous control in very challenging environments is just one great example of of, of recent robotics progress and 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 how and how we're able to do things today that were just you know a dream a few few decades ago. Yeah, and in fact, you you kind of referred to a few terms that become quite interesting here, right? And and I think it might be useful to explain that to the broader community because there's a little bit of overlap so kind of the distinction helps which is you know what is the relationship between ai autonomy and robotics are they supersets overlaps can you just walk through that a little bit sure um so you know uh they are very interrelated ideas, and and uh, and so let me let me sort of walk walk through them in the following way. Um, you know, the dream of artificial intelligence is now seventy odd years old, and in fact, while formerly computer scientists and others have dreamed of it for seven decades, my suspicion is that there are people who have been thinking about it even longer. Um, and so. So the, the idea has always been attractive that could one synthesize intelligent behavior um, in, in, in sort of um, as, as, a, as a result of building uh, systems? Um, would it be possible to synthesize machines that you know, we would recognize as exhibiting some degree of intelligent behavior? And uh, you know, leaving aside the precise notion of what people may mean by that, it's always been a captivating idea, right? And so people have studied this idea, and there's been a discipline called artificial intelligence in the computer science community for several decades, many, many decades. Wow. And it turns out that synthesizing artificial, uh, artificially intelligent behavior is non-trivial. It's very, very difficult to do. Um, early on, when scientists started studying this, computer scientists started studying this, there was a certain sense that, you know, it would be achievable very, very soon. And some people made predictions that would be achievable within less than a decade. And that has proved not to be the case. It, 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 intelligent behavior has so many facets to it. Um, interacting with the world, uh, extracting information from the world, processing that information in ways that, that make sense, and then acting in some way that furthers your cause. And uh, you know, if you're a robot that's uh, trying to navigate in an environment, your cause may be to be efficient in your navigation behavior. If you're, a, um, if you're an agent trying to help somebody um, you know, write well or speak coherently, your cause may be to give them useful advice. And so AI encompasses all these things, a, is a synthesized artifact that exhibits intelligence. Now, robotics specifically is the science of grounding these kinds of artifacts in physical reality. So a, a robot um, is, a, is a physical entity. It acts on the physical world. Um, it, it makes measurements and senses what's going on in its environment around it, and then acts on the physical world. And so maybe one distinction that one can draw between, uh, between intelligent behavior more generally and robotics is that in robotics, we really care about, about physical instantiation. And so while labs like mine and, and many, many others seek to understand how to build intelligent robots, we, we are interested fundamentally in grounding intelligence in, in the physical world. Uh, there are others who study AI purely as a software artifact, uh, where the information that goes in and the information that comes out might not be grounded in the physical world. You might ask, for example, an artificially intelligent software agent questions about the world and expect it to answer, and the whole thing lives inside a computer. And the so there are bots. And exactly. And so there are fields of AI that 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 you know concentrate on work like that, right? Autonomy is a is a sort of a broader idea that a synthesized artifact or agent has the ability to do things as far as possible without relying too much on other things. And it's a nebulous idea, 
we want many intelligent robots to be autonomous. And indeed, you know, there is an entire field of autonomous robots. There's, in fact, a journal by this name that for which I serve as the editor-in-chief. Um, and the idea there is that you don't want to rely too much on intervention. You don't want to rely on intervention from external entities, right? If a robot is autonomous, it can operate for long periods of time without relying on potentially on people, things of that type, right? Um, and so these ideas are very related, um, but it's entirely possible to build useful robots that are not autonomous. They may be plugged into the wall and may require frequent attention from humans, but nevertheless, they're very, very useful in what they do. Or maybe they exhibit autonomy over short time horizons and not over very long time horizons. And so these ideas are connected, but they don't have to be, they don't, they, they, they're not proper subsets or supersets of each other. Um, similarly, artificially intelligent artifacts may not may not be robots, uh, physical robots. They may be soft bots, as you said, or they or they may be physically grounded. So these are very sort of connected ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, what I'm most excited about is that these ideas are all at the very forefront of where the field is today. And so it's one of the hardest areas in computer science today, and most excitingly beyond computer science today. Um, particularly because one of the key drivers for modern AI and autonomy and robotics has been the rise of machine learning, which is really has had a long and storied history, but over the last decade has really come into its own, driven largely by data-driven methods that have really proved to be such a success. And so there's just a collection of these ideas that are really really driving the field forward and uh, and causing just a whole lot of excitement. Now, I think this is a great explanation, right? So if I think about it, robotics uh, is an evolving field where um, various sensors or basically a machine is reacting autonomously to its environment, right? And as AI keeps improving, that autonomy can go from reactive to potentially proactive and strategic. Is that a simple way of putting it? Yeah, I think so. Uh, I think so. The simplest robots very often are reactive machines. But of course, we want robots to pro be proactive. We want them to plan. We want them to be able to look forward in time, make decisions over longer time horizons. And all of that requires all of that requires reasoning and some ability to, to model what's going on in the world outside. Now, this is this is great, right? and, and you kind of mentioned it, right? So artificial intelligence is maybe a uh, part of computer science, as you say, but it's really gone well beyond computer science, medical science, uh, mechanical sciences. All, all those things are beginning to come together because that's actually how you would get to a greater intelligence. And so part of what I think I like the direction here, and it's closer to my heart, is how do you know, embedded systems kind of spur the growth of AI, not just in robotics, but in autonomy and, and the broader growth of machine learning? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's actually a topic that's very near to my heart as well. When I started my lab, I named it the Robotic Embedded Systems Lab for, a, for, for exactly this reason. Um, one of the drivers for growth in robotics and, and more broadly in AI has been the rise of embedded systems, whether you see them on board robots or in edge devices or in a variety of other incarnations. And they've just been sort of have powered the, the, the rise of uh, physically deployed AI systems. And I think that trend is going to continue. I think advances in low power embedded systems with ever increasing capability, um, coupled with advances in sensing systems and sensor technologies, and sometimes the integration of these two, is really going to continue to be a major driver for both robotics and autonomy. Um, and in fact, uh, much of the growth in robotics I alluded to earlier, you know, the rise of compute, uh, whether it's sort of in the cloud or whether it's embedded and on board the robot, and the rise of sensing have really been sort of the pillars on which robotics has been built. No, that that makes sense. And in fact, you know, you kind of touched on one of the key challenges that obviously we deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis as well. Obviously, data-driven over the last decade, AI has kind of exploded, but that's also becoming a challenge for scale if everything has to go to the cloud for that intelligence, 
right? So the, the idea of distributed intelligence that you mentioned that is closer and in, effectively in symphony with what can be done on the cloud is better. However, as things scale, you need these things to be real time and closer and closer to the edge, right? And you kind of brought that up as well. The ability for edge devices to be smarter, modules to be available where you can do smarter things close by in smaller contexts is important. And then in fact, from our standpoint, uh, Brainship obviously inspired by surprise, the human brain, <laughs> uh, which is as far as we know, the most efficient learning and predictive inference engine known. How can we actually maximize that computation? How can we reduce energy consumption to help with autonomy, um, to help with uh, you know, uh, remote uh, abilities without compromising what you're doing, let's say in the cloud, right? Without compromising accuracy, without co compromising performance is something that we kind of grapple with uh, day to day, and we are beginning to see some of those trends going forward. So do you have a view on how neuromorphic computing with its real push on efficiency, with its uh, ability to actually learn and more and more at the edge can help with the growth of um, autonomy and uh, robotics? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a really, I think it's a really neat, it's a really neat question. Um, and I think a very pertinent one. Um, you know, for robots to be active, they have to close very fast control loops from perception to action. And it's difficult to do that if you are going over a network connection to the cloud, um, uh, if you have sort of variable latencies and things of that type. And so a, a onboard closing of the loop is essential to almost every robotic system. And so edge devices or embedded systems and robots are, 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 are where this happens. And uh, modern machine learning based methods that generate very large models to, to, um, to power robots today um, are, are, sort of, are sort of the beginning but there's already work underway to distill some of those models down into, into much smaller models that can run on embedded devices. In fact, one of the papers we're working on right now is to distill models like that down to very small embedded devices that can, that can uh, fit on board um, quadrot or flying platforms so that they can, they can uh, fly around and, um, and do tasks together. And so, so the sort of ability to, to squeeze models down into these small footprints um, so that you can get performance out of them um, with low latency is a very attractive thing. And it's something that I am predicting we'll see a lot more of um, in, in, in AI and robotics. And embedded systems and growth in embedded systems is sort of the very heart of this. Um, so that's one aspect. The other aspect, of course, is the one you alluded to, which is, which is uh, energy efficiency. Um, so you need on robots, if you want robots to be autonomous long-term, you want them to be energy efficient. And having energy efficient onboard compute is an is a integral piece of this. So there's the latency issue for which you need a highly performant embedded system on board. There's the there's the sort of uh, energy efficiency issue, which directly plays to autonomy, and then the 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 third issue is there are certain kinds of uh, measurements on the robot or on on a device, which for a variety of reasons you may not want to send um, out. You may want to keep them local. Um, one reason may be privacy, and for that reason, having a capable, performant embedded system or an edge device becomes crucial. And so for, you know, for whether it be for reasons of efficiency or, you know, in terms of speed, uh, low latency, um, and the, or, or, or for energy efficiency, which both of which feed into autonomy, or for privacy, I think there are several, several advantages to, to, uh, to embedded systems um, and neuromorphic computing in particular. Thanks. I think you've kind of pushed out all the points that we think are valuable. So I'm glad there is resonance there. And 
the whole point is neuromorphic computing has been considered to be kind of the next bastion, but I think we took a, an approach that can actually bring that technology sooner to today's models. So we're quite excited how, about how that happens. But speaking of the bridge between research and industry, right? You've been an Amazon scholar. You have worked closely with a number of other organizations as well. How can industry help move this research forward? How do we collaborate? How can we help universities and how can universities help us? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, I think, the, I think the partnership between industry and academia is, is crucial here to make progress. Uh, there are several ways, I think, in which in which this this nexus can be mutually beneficial. Um, of course, you know, in a fast moving area like like AI or like robotics, um, one of the main advantages that that industry can bring to academia is to is to work with faculty um, directly in in sort of in sort of brainstorming project ideas. And even potentially, even potentially supporting student projects that that allow academics to experiment with ideas that are relevant to industry at the cutting edge, but have a certain basic number of unanswered questions to them. The advantage of a rapidly moving area is that there's a whole frontier of such problems. Um, there's, you know, with every passing day, there are there are more sort of these these open problems at the cutting edge, which both need to be solved for an industrial partner, but also make interesting questions for academics to investigate. And so partnering on these in joint projects, I think is a very productive way to, to make progress. It's also excellent for the students who work on these projects because they see, they see the work that they do uh, and the faculty creating new knowledge being directly useful and directly transferable to something that can that can result in um, in a commercial application. The you know companies like uh, yours, like Brainchip, what you're doing with the University Accelerator Program, um, I like very much. In fact, we're looking into it. As you know, we'll be having a follow-on conversation about 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 uh, exploring that further. I think programs like that are unique and can really make the nexus between uh, between a, a a leading company and academia sort of uh, be tighter and be stronger. Um, all of this, of course, is on top of the more conventional things like recruiting pipelines and you know having students be exposed to the work that's happening um, at at various companies and so on. Um, so I think there's a lot that can be done, but tight partnerships with well defined problems. Um, particularly in, in a fast moving field like like the one we're discussing, I think is 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 absolutely the way to go. So I, I, I love the fact that you have a specific university accelerator for this purpose. Thanks, yeah, we're quite excited by it. And we, we see the value there as well, especially because I think your morphic computing is still, um, has, has a lot of uh, evolution still to come. And the universities are, somewhat driving uh, a lot of that, uh, that work. But speaking of universities compute, congratulations, first of all, on the uh, launch of your Frontiers of Computing initiative. Um, in fact, I'd look forward to see what, where that goes, but can you give our uh, listeners a bit of uh, insight into that? Sure, yeah, thank you so much. Um, so, you know, USC launched very recently a, a very ambitious initiative called the Frontiers of Computing. It's a billion dollar commitment by the university to really uh, make impact at the frontiers of computing in almost every dimension you can imagine. Um, this is a this is simultaneously an initiative to do cutting edge research, cutting edge research in every area of computing, um, spanning all the way from hardware to software, algorithms, AI, machine learning, robotics, um, virtually every area of computing that you can imagine. But at the same time, is also a commitment that we will fundamentally reimagine how we educate all our students at USC uh, to be digitally fluent. And so it's really a commitment that, you know, whatever major you're studying, um, if you come to USC, 
as part of this initiative, you have the opportunity to really immerse yourself into into the very frontiers of computing so that you can you can really be at the cutting edge. Computing is changing so many disciplines, whether it's business or whether it's medicine or whether it's fundamental scientific discovery, that there is a real opportunity here, not just to not just to do new research and to innovate, but also fundamentally rethink how we educate the next generation to be really computationally and digitally fluent. And so the initiative really is all about not only doing and inventing the future of computing, but also to educate the next generation to be really fluent in this enterprise. And so that's that's the, you know, we're very excited by it. It's going to be it's going to be just a. It's going to be a, a really a, a, a game changer, in my opinion. Um, I also want to say that, you know, as part of this initiative, we are also fundamentally reimagining how we think about engineering. So, you know, I'm a professor of computer science, and I, you know, I do robotics, um, but I'm housed in a school of engineering, and computing has really fundamentally altered the engineering discipline. It's almost, it's almost inconceivable today to, to not be touched or not contribute to some aspect of computing if you're in a school of engineering. And so we also see this as an opportunity to really re, reimagine the future of engineering. And we're doing this uh, by creating a new um, school of advanced computing within the school of engineering here. So within our Viterbi School of Engineering, we are creating a School of Advanced Computing, which is really a commitment to rethinking engineering and a commitment to the rest of the to the rest of the disciplines at the university to really collaborate um, on all aspects of computing and to educate all our students to be fluent in computing. That sounds actually not just ambitious, but uh, pretty compelling to think about engineering and all the disciplines in reverse order almost computation is a foundation for all of that so i mean i look forward to what you guys are going to go do there and wish you all the best on that thank you and so i think that brings us pretty close to the end of it which we'd like to understand right your parting thoughts of you know where you see um compute and uh, especially neural compute AI as a discipline evolving, do you think we'll see a singularity in our lifetime? So I'm not so sure about the singularity, but... but I had to try. I had to try. <laughs> but, if you, but if you sort of ask me for the future of computation, then I think at least in terms of computation as enabler for, for so many things we do, I mean, I think one major growing need is the need for sort of AI native computing paradigms. So, you know, the way the way we, we take graphics acceleration for granted on on a on on a on hardware today, I think AI acceleration for computing is absolutely it's absolutely going to be necessary. I mean, it's already coming. Um, I think so, you know, just in terms of sort of sort of advances in, in computation, that's, I think, going to be a, a fairly big one. Um, I think on the on the algorithmic side, on the software side, there are, you know, tremendous advances to look forward to on making on making sense of all the data. The 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 modern paradigm is so heavily data driven that. I think there will be fundamental advances needed in the future to really rethink how to handle large data in ways that are efficient and can can you know can 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 allow can allow machines to really reason about about very complex problems um, and can and can really sort of exhibit the kind of autonomy that that we've been you know thinking about for a while and solve problems for us that we you know we really really um, would benefit from. Um, this is true um, for for almost everything we think about in robotics as well, and so I'm really looking forward to sort of the future and you know how future compute evolves because it's been such a it's been such a sort of mainstay of of many of the advances that we've seen over the past couple of decades. Well, that sounds that sounds fair, and I think uh, I will 
stop from asking you about predictions about what robots start doing tomorrow or next year. But Yara, thank you so much for taking the time. I know it's a busy week with all the paper submissions that you and your team are doing. So we appreciate the time given and obviously really appreciate the insights that you've provided. And uh, wishing you all the best with the next steps uh, with the future of computing, as well as love to see what goes on in the robotics lab. And hopefully we work together much closer soon. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure. Thanks for listening to the Brain Chip Podcast. Please remember to rate and review on your favorite podcast platform. 